There are two skills that every engineer should be developing from day one in their career until the day that they retire. And in this episode of The Civil Engineering CEO, I have with me Gary Doms, President, CEO, and Chairman of the Board of TNM Associates. And Gary's gonna talk about what those two skills are, how and why you should develop them, and he's also gonna talk about how firms and professionals in the civil engineering industry must be adapting and evolving every day. Before we jump in with Gary, a quick word from our sponsor. Since Pannoni's founding more than five decades ago, their clients trust Pannoni's commitment to elevating the impact of projects in the communities they serve. By partnering with their clients, they establish relationships that create trust and longevity. Pannoni approaches the start of every project as the beginning of a collaboration. With the rapid change in technology, Pannoni's clients know they are getting innovative methods in delivering quality services for smart, sustainable, and resilient solutions. Pannoni is relentless in their aim to bring fresh perspective and new technologies. Pannoni measures achievement in innovation, efficiency, and excellence. Its milestones are bigger than any one project, and every project affects the community, no matter how large or small. For more information, visit Pannoni.com. That's P-E-N-N-O-N-I dot com. Now I'm excited to welcome my guest on to the show today. Gary Doms is the president, CEO, and chairman of the board of TNM Associates. Gary, welcome to the Civil Engineering CEO. Thank you. Very much enjoy being here. Looking forward to it. Yeah. So, Gary, let's get started. Maybe just telling us a little bit about your company. What do you do? Where are you located? Type of services you offer? So, TNM Associates, uh, we're actually uh, 56 years old this year. Actually, we'll be 57 in. Uh, St. Patrick's Day is basically our anniversary, which I like to, it's easy to remember. <laughs> um, but we are, um, we were founded as a municipal engineering company and we've grown to be about 350 employees. We're in 19 offices in eight different states. Uh, we've divided up to be in uh, three geographic regions. We've got regional headquarters in the Northeast here in New Jersey and Middletown, that's our corporate headquarters. We also have a um, regional headquarters in Philadelphia for our uh, mid-Atlantic uh, region, and also also a uh, headquarters in Dublin, Ohio, uh, right by Ohio State, which is our Midwest uh, regional headquarters. We uh, have grown from that original uh, municipal engineering founding to uh, have 10 practices, which is uh, a little unique for a company our size, a mid-sized company that has 10 different practices uh, five, what I would call our core practices, which are municipal engineering, which we were founded on, transportation, you know, roads, bridges, uh, transit, um, environmental, um, water resources, and site development, real estate development. Uh, those are our five core practices, the larger practices, and they probably constitute maybe 60 or 65 percent of our revenue. Then we have five smaller, more emerging practices, which include um, program management, construction management, automation and energy, uh, natural hazards, which is uh, was born out of uh, our headquarters here in Middletown uh, and municipal engineering. We were at the epicenter of Sandy, Superstorm Sandy, uh, and we did a lot of recovery work and, and remediation work for our municipal clients. Out of that was born the natural hazards practice, which we are contracted through FEMA. And we're actually, uh, one of the regions we have is the Southeast where a lot of hurricanes. So we get involved with precondition surveys and then post-condition ass assessments. Uh, and probably the last practice we have is uh, health and safety, where we do health and safety and compliance plans and permitting for both public and private entities. So those are our you know, 10 practices. Um, and again, a little bit, unique for a company our size, but uh, we find it helps us weather different economic conditions times. We have a, a great um, ability to cross sell those different services to different clients and uh, be able to plant flags in different areas with small practices and then grow them uh, to, to encompass the other practices. 
Hmm. Wow, that's awesome. And I think I'm glad you you kind of talked, you mentioned the word emerging there, which I'm glad because I want to talk a little bit about the idea of, you know, adapting in today's world, which it sounds like TNM has done pretty well in, you know, creating some of these different divisions, which is, which we'll get into. But to take it one step further now, let's talk a little bit about your career so far, because I think what's pretty cool about your experience from what I've seen is that you've been there a long time and you've gone through this entire transition from being an engineer, kind of working on the projects from day to day to now, of course, leading the firm from more of a strategic big picture standpoint. So, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit about your progression and how this all happened. I mean, you know, most of the time people tell me, you know, CEO wasn't necessarily my goal. I ended up getting there, but, you know, I'm curious to hear how that all unfolded and how you kind of grew with the company. Sure. So, uh, interesting enough, uh, my father was a businessman. He owned his own business. So I think that type of um, entrepreneurship or entrepreneurial spirit was in my genes from the beginning, although I didn't know it at the time. Um, so um, as, uh, as we had talked a little earlier, we both went to Lafayette. My father went to Lafayette and he got a business degree and ended up creating his own, making his own business, buying his own business and uh, was very, very successful at it. I spent my high school and college years working in the summers for him. Um, but I also had an uncle who was an engineer uh, and he saw my, uh, my, my ex excellence in science and math and took me out on project sites where he was doing the engineering. He was actually the Monmouth County engineer at the time. Hmm. And I think that's where the engineer part of me was ignited. You know, the spirit of me was ignited. And I went to Lafayette for engineering. Uh, when I got out of school, uh, my uncle told me if I was a structural engineer, um, designing and uh, looking at repairing bridges, which were in the worst condition ever, I'd have a job for life. So I was a structural engineer. My first job out of school was with a structural engineering firm in North Jersey. I uh, had a great five or six years there, got learned a lot, um, got engaged to a secretary that worked there and said, I do not want to settle in North Jersey. I want to move back to Monmouth County where I grew up by the beach. So I called my uncle again and he um, directed me to TNM Associates. So that's how I came to TNM Associates mm -hmm. roughly 36 years ago. And I started as a staff engineer. Um, and I think some of the things that shaped my career, um, one, I think that spirit I got from my father, I was always willing to take chances and go outside the box a little bit, you know, and advance my career, whatever that may be from a staff engineer to maybe a a group manager or a manager, then maybe running a practice. And there was an opportunity at TNM, who at the time was a municipal engineering firm, to work for a developer uh, on a real estate project, which was a brand new practice for the company. Um, not so much new engineering. On the municipal side, we would review those plans and stuff. Now we would be on the developer side and actually designing them. So I raised my hand and I got a chance to um, work for that new client. And uh, I got lucky uh, on a couple of different fronts. I had a great mentor here at TNM Associates. It was actually the second president at TNM, Bernie Blum. He was the CEO president at the time. He was my mentor in this new practice. Um, picked it up quick, and it was right at the height when real estate was booming here in New Jersey uh, before 08 and 09. This was probably the late uh, early 90s, if I had a guess. And grew the practice from the original one developer into um, one of the two largest practices in the company in about five or six years. So through that experience of growing the business and taking on new opportunities and thinking outside the box and getting an opportunity and running with it and being successful at it, I think really shaped me in terms of the leaders of the company as to you know the potential next leader of the company. No, nobody ever really told me that. Um, but I continued to get training, leadership training, ultimately became a stockholder, then on the board of directors. And in uh, the early 2000s, uh, probably mid 2000s, I was tapped to be um, more leadership training and maybe be the next um, CEO. Wow. So uh, hard work. I think some of that spirit, being willing to take a little bit of a risk and relying a lot on mentors and support was, uh, I think, the key to where I got to today. And I have a lot of good memories looking back, and I take a lot of that in my leadership style going forward. Yeah, so a couple of things there I just want to kind of reinforce a little bit for those listening. 
that I think are really important in the world of civil engineering is one, there's a lot of different things you can do in civil engineering. And I think you don't want to, you know, kind of put yourself into a box, if you will, because, you know, to Gary's point, you know, he tried, he was willing and open to try different things. I think sometimes we feel like we went to school for civil engineering and maybe we had a focus in structural or we had a focus in geotechnical and I can't really do anything else. And you kind of put yourself in that box. And I know for me, something that happened to me when I started working at a multidiscipline consulting firm out of college was I tried structural. I wasn't crazy about it. I tried geotechnical. I wasn't crazy about it. And lucky enough, they had different disciplines and I fell into land development and I loved it. And I hadn't really heard of land development in college because there was not, wasn't like land development classes. So my point to you is, is that you might be doing something today, but it doesn't mean you have to do it for 20 years or, you know, whatever the case may be. I mean, that's the, I think that's one of the beautiful things about civil engineering is there's lots of flexibility. And as you heard Gary talk about earlier, even some of the other divisions and services that TNM has rolled out, I tell people all the time, there's going to be jobs for civil engineers tomorrow that didn't exist today. So there's going to be new stuff out there, which is also awesome. Um, but I just want to highlight that because I think that's an important part of um, Gary's journey. And I think the other thing is, you know, saying yes to opportunities. Hey, you want to go on this project site? You want to try this? We got a new client. We got a new service. Yeah, I'll, you know, I'll try it. I, I want to try. I want to get experience with different things. It doesn't mean you're, again, you'll be locked into it. But oftentimes you find these opportunities when you say yes and you try different things and then you also, you know, can make better decisions about kind of, you know, where you want to go next. And I know, Gary, you mentioned there at the end, <clears throat> some of this has influenced kind of your leadership and your management style. So if if we were to ask kind of your staff or your team members there what your management style is, or your leadership style is, how do you think they would answer that question? I would say... Uh... Collaborative. I'm definitely a collaborative type person in, in management and leadership and enabling. I am a strong believer in uh, enabling those who are on my team to do their job, mentor them, and, but let them go with it. Let them run with it, not micromanage. Um, I think that's um, that somewhat plays into, I think, when I, when I became the CEO and president is really when we start my vision. My vision was to grow the company in both geography and, and practices. I think we, at the time when I took over, we were one of the largest companies in New Jersey, very heavily focused on municipal and transportation and, and water and sewer and, and site because of me. Um, when, you're, when you're saturated in a certain market, there's a lot of, it's harder to grow. So I had strategic hires. I found people who I thought would be great for our team fulfill my vision of going outside the boundaries of New Jersey, fulfill my dream of, of adding more practices that were complementary to our practices and, and had a lot of synergy. And I think all that comes out of that very first opportunity with real estate development, not being key, be able to look at that as an opportunity, not a challenge. I think all that plays into somewhat my leadership style and, and the team I have around me. Yeah, and I think that piece of it that you mentioned, the, the the good balance between knowing when you have to get involved at a deeper level and when you can let someone take it and run with it is kind of something that, as a leader, it takes a little bit of time to get that down, but it's such an important piece of leadership because – if you get in too deep, you're in trouble. But if you, you know, sometimes if you let people run with it too fast, you can also be in trouble. You got to kind of get to know your people, surround yourself with the right people and figure that out, which is a back and forth. <laughs> back and forth. And, and not only just let them run with it, have them have the confidence and the comfort to come to me hmm. when they need help. Right. Not to be afraid, you know, let's, let's get some advice from the old man, you know, it's, <laughs> so yeah, so it's, it's that kind of leadership style we have. We have a, you know, very, very proud this past year. Um, first time we have won best places to work in every one of the regions we've been in New Jersey, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania as a whole in the Midwest. And that I think speaks to wow. the culture of the company and who we are. And, you know, those surveys are by the employees. So it's, it's a great I'm very proud of the fact that we want it. And also we get a lot of great feedback. You know, we, we may be best places to work, but that doesn't mean we're done being better. We can always improve. And so we, we are continuing to do that. So, yes. That's awesome. Well, congratulations. That's a great accomplishment. And I will say too, I was, I was talking with another um, CEO of a, a civil firm down South 
yesterday and he said something similar where that he, they had like a younger professionals event within their company. He said, he got right out there at the tables and said, tell me, tell me whatever you want to tell me, tell me the good things, tell me the bad things, kind of reinforcing the point that, you know, you got to come to to the leaders. You got to be able to have a conversation with us if you need help, because we want to help you. We want you to be successful. And I think your, your point, Gary, is an important one is that as a leader, we need to make our team comfortable enough to approach us in any situation because oftentimes they will be afraid. They will say, Gary's very busy with all kinds of important stuff. I can't bother him with this. And at the end of the day, that's just hurts kind of everyone involved. So that promoting that culture is so important as a leader in today's world. Hugely important. And it's, it's, it's interesting. We are, we are in today's world. We have five generations of workers in this company. You know, from the baby boomers, only Gen Z, Gen X, and every one of those generations has a little bit different style, different uh, motivators, and, and um, different ways of the work-life balance. It, it's so interesting in this right now in this day and age. How you have to have you have to be aware of all them, and and when you're decision making, you got to be comprehensive or uh, um, aware of what the decision could have on each one of those generations, and it's. Uh, We've done a good job of that. We get input from all that. We have, you know, next gen, we have associate, we have all these different programs to rather to appeal to all the various generations. So it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, sure. And over the last couple of years, I mean, to say things have been a little tumultuous is an, an understatement, but um, you know, as a leader, you know, everyone is kind of looking to you to see your reaction to these types of things, you know, kind of feed off of you in terms of how you react and respond. How do you kind of not overreact or underreact? Like, how do you, you know, try to make sure that you're kind of staying at an even keel so that people that are looking up to you maybe don't get panicked or maybe don't get, you know, talk a little bit about how you handle things like that, knowing that kind of people are kind of watching your reaction. So a couple of things. I think, again, something I got from my father, my father being a, a business owner, retail store he had. Sure. Um, he had, uh, and I watched him in dealings with very, very happy customers, very, very irate customers, upset customers. Um, and just, you know, watching how he handled that, I think as I learned my early lessons on being very even killed. And from him, in any of those situations, both, very positive and, and negative, obviously the positive more easy. You, you got to show some reaction there, hmm. but I always sit back and say, ask the questions. You got to don't look at the emotion right now, dig down into what's driving the emotion. What, what are the, you know, ask some questions, get the person to calm down somewhat and really find out what's, what, what is the cause root of what's bothering them? Cause then you can deal with the, not the symptoms, but the cause. And that's always easier to deal with because usually it's, an easier solution. So I always have learned to step back, listen and question and, and calm the situation down. And it's, uh, it's proven to be successful for me. Yeah, that's great. Like not, I think not overreacting until you, you know, you're trying to understand all the information before you kind of react or move forward, you know, too quickly. I think that that yeah. is another, an, again, another art form in today's world where everything seems to move at a hundred million miles an hour to be able to kind of slow it down in the, in the moment, you know, not to yeah. say you're not going to then react fast enough, but you still need to make sure you have the proper information before you just go off on a tangent. So, exactly so, right. Yep. So, so that's great to hear. So the world is changing, technology is changing, and it has such big impacts in the civil engineering world. I mean, you mentioned alone some of the, the different disciplines that you've started there, and you know, you're doing all kinds of stuff. You know, would affirm your size <clears throat> from a technology standpoint. I know it could be something that can be difficult to keep up with all the different technology out there. How do you kind of keep, you know, keep your thumb on the pulse of technology? How does that work for affirm your size when things are always changing? So it's been, uh, you're right, it's, it's the change. And I think COVID, one of the outcomes from COVID, I tell this to my team, it took what I would, what I was um, maybe five years of evolution in technology, in our right. business, accelerated in six months. I mean, in six months, we went from full-time in the office. And, and one day, we went from full-time in the office, February 13th, if I remember right, from in the office, Send out an email to the company. We're going to work from home. 
and we had already progressed technology wise to have people having you know laptops or services to bring home but in that one day i think the the technology acceleration of technology and the maturity of technology from five years really evolved into about six months and work habits and work styles and the hybrid really mm -hmm. accelerated so we were we had advanced it enough so that we could do that, but we recognized the senior leadership team here at TAM that technology was the wave of the future to run our business, to how to how to manage and run our business. So we were making those steps, but soon, during COVID, it became evident that whatever we could learn and apply to our business, we could also sell to our clients. We could we could help our clients do a better job in this world of technology and automation and data and mining the data and using the data. So we, we started an initiative of one, we're gonna invest internally because we have to. And two, we're gonna have it in our mindset. How can we ultimately take that investment and turn it into a revenue producing part of this to help fund its own investment? And that, that mindset has really helped us. I think one internally, keep up or ahead of the, of the curve and also, you know, start to earn some revenue out of it. We're actually hiring people to want to do development internal, but also do development work for clients. So it's been a, a nice marriage of um, compatible, um, no needs, both internal and external. The other, the other thing, this industry, I would say, if not the biggest, one of the biggest uh, challenges right now is there's a shortage of shortage of engineers we we are in a hiring dilemma we we cannot find enough people and technology will has and will continue to allow us to bridge that resource gap that, that staffing gap the more we can effectively can use technology and automate things in the engineering world and a lot of it's it needs thinking but a lot of it's repetitive calculations automation you can substitute that technology for people. Now that's gonna require a whole new mindset in billing and client expectations, et cetera. But I think technology is, is an answer to the, the uh, shortage of uh, resources and employees. Yeah, and that's really the biggest challenge that every firm is telling us right now, right? We just can't hire fast enough. And and it's only going to get worse because there's infrastructure funding coming and there's bigger projects coming down the road and our infrastructure is not going to fix itself, you know, in the future. So, so you know, to Gary's point, I do definitely agree that the technology can help us with that. I mean, it's, you know, there's only a couple of different solutions to that problem. And one of them, of course, is the technology. Another one, obviously, is we need more engineers, which isn't happening fast enough. And, you know, for those of you out there that might be saying, oh, you know, we don't want to like automate our jobs away. That's not going to happen because if you're an engineer right now and you don't have a job, you're probably not looking in the right spot. I mean, there is just, there's so much work out there that even if, you know, we can do some automation to help us with it, we're still going to need more engineers. So I, I definitely like that approach on the technology side of things and taking it kind of one step further here, Gary, you mentioned how in February, you know, you kind of overnight, you had to go, you went all remote and, I, and there was big changes made to the industry where people said forever, you know, small civil engineering or midsize civil engineering, you just can't do civil engineering remotely. Well, that, that got completely flipped upside down and also, um, but how do you handle that now going forward in terms of the whole work arrangement, remote in the office. I know firms do it differently. Some people have open policy. Some people do a couple of days a week. How has t &M kind of approached that? So typical engineering, when this first happened, we started to have a very structured approach that we wanted to, that I wanted to apply across the whole company. And we quickly learned that that was not the best solution. And as we continue to learn more for COVID, actually our production was good. Our quality was still good. Um, Obviously, people, depending on the, the individuals, found it more productive to be working from home. So we've struck what I would call a, a balance, and it's almost by team, because there are different cultures, subcultures with different teams. Small offices, for example, had a much more um, collegial type team, and they would, they would come into the office once or twice or three times a week. You know, at, at office days, but they were a small office, maybe 10 or 12, 15 people. The corporate office here in Middletown, where we've got 160 people, that approach didn't work. It wasn't going to work. So we, we have a more 
uh, looser, if you will, individual different teams within the accounting team is in pretty much every day. Uh, the proposal team is in a couple of days a week. So the teams actually are sort of setting their own schedules. One of the things we did do across the company, because there's all these different variations, and by the way, I think we're still in the learning stage of this. I think as, sure. as, we, as we continue to, and what, one of the, let me make one other point. One of the things we learned that as a team, as a group of people start to come to the office more, the rest of the team is going to follow. Them. They don't want to miss something. They don't want that. So if you get if you get the managers and some of the senior leaders of a team that come into the office, the workers are going to you know the staff are going to follow them, not by dictate, but because they want to be there. Um. So I was going to say something. I forgot what it was. Anyway. Um, so so yeah, you're saying you're still learning in this process. Yes. Still trying and to and it's out. going to it's going to continue to evolve, right? And and our you know the end result of this. We're growing, we're profitable. We've had, in the last five years, every year has been better than the last. So we're doing something right. So let's, you know, let's not fix it if it's not broken, but continue to grow and evolve with it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I really like the idea of a team approach because we, we kind of take that approach here at EMI too. It's like every team has goals that they want to accomplish and we kind of leave it up to the team leader to say, you know, you work with your team and figure out what it's going to take to achieve those goals, regardless of where they're working, right? Because, you know, every team works differently, you have different habits, different tendencies, different things you need to do and execute on. Um, and that has seemed to work pretty well. Um, and But like you said, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day or the next day, you kind of have to keep evolving with it. Exactly. One of the other things we've done is uh, the executive team, which is basically the C-suite, CEO, COO, CFO, we have uh, made a commitment and have traveled to various offices. We have monthly meetings and we will go to the various offices and have those meetings in those offices and court and combine that with either a lunch, an office lunch or, you know, something to bring the people in and meet them face to face where, you know, so it's a commitment from the executive team, you know, go to, go to, Bethlehem or go to Philadelphia or go to Columbus or go to Indianapolis, go to the, and have the meeting there. And that usually generates a fairly, you know, high uh, attendance from the office staff that are, that are there to see us. So it's, and it's been good. That's great. I like that a lot because I do think that I think you can do a lot of stuff remotely. I think where you might miss out a little bit is on relationships and on mentoring. And those are yes. two areas where I think, you know, we really need to continue to try to make that happen. And it sounds like you've got a plan in place to do that by having leaders visit the offices, which is great. So, yeah, one of the big topics in our industry for good reason is kind of diversity and inclusion, equity. Um, talk a little bit about how kind of T&M approaches, you know, DEI and, and, you know, what are some of the things you're doing there? Well, both diversity and inclusion are uh, two of our seven core values that we've established actually back in 2020 when we set up our mission, vision, and core values. And we live them every day. We have continuing education. We have um, just not, not only by skill and capability and experience, but two of my board members are females. In 2021, almost two years ago, we formulated, founded uh, the TNM Associates Foundation. Hmm. And a little side story on that. When we were celebrating, getting ready to celebrate our 50th anniversary in 2016, we formed a, uh, a committee from all the demographics in the company, from the you know young engineers to the old timers uh, who have been here for a long time. And that committee came up with um, a way to celebrate our 50th anniversary was going to be 50 ways of giving. And we were going to have over the 50 weeks in the year, 52 weeks in the year, we were going to have one event a week where we were going to give back to our clients, our communities, or, you know, give back to all the people that made us successful for the 50 years. Uh, one of the interesting things we did, we had eight clients when we first started the company 50 years ago, seven of those clients are still clients and they're still clients today. So we took and gave a scholarship to those uh, high schools in those seven towns uh, for STEM student. Um, but that, that longevity of and loyalty of clients to us is sort of speaks to our culture. But anyway, that 50, 50 different events turned into 92 events. It was so embraced 
by both the employees and the clients that it planted a seed in my head. You know, we we should do something better than just once a year. We should do something more than just on our 50th anniversary. That started the wheels in motion. And in 2021, we officially rolled out TNM Associates Foundation, which has four main pillars, STEM, you know, scholarships, charitable giving back to our communities, um, volunteerism, and fundraising for various events for our, our clients. And in that, the DNI is a prominent piece of that foundation in terms of leadership, in terms of scholarships, in terms of giving back to underserved communities. It's a it's a it's a core initiative in in the foundation, which is obviously part of TNM. We also have a focus um, in uh, providing education and volunteerism through the foundation and also through TNM into many of our underserved communities and job creation programs, et cetera. So it's, it's part of our everyday fabric. And one of the uh, ways we do that at TNM is we have a, it's called give a wow. And any employee can give a wow to any other employee. It could be a supervisor to a, a staff, a staff to a supervisor. It could be horizontal. It could be somebody could give me a wow. I could, and in order to give a wow, you have to identify which core value that person represented in, in whatever they did. What was the core value that was in the, in the act that they did? And that, again, diversity and inclusion come up a lot in these, in these sure. different models. So it's, it's, I mean, it's only going to be successful, uh, Anthony, if, if you live it. If you, if you lead by example, that's probably another thing. Lead by example. Uh, and if you believe in it every day and, and people watch you, it's going to be real. Yeah, no, you're right. And I think that you have to, it's one of those things you can't just talk the talk. You got to walk the walk. And it sounds like, you know, the foundation is really giving you a great avenue to be able to do that in a lot of ways, which is awesome. Cause I know it's, you know, creating a foundation is a whole, a big project, a big process. And I'm sure it requires a lot of attention and you know, a lot of work there. So it did, it, it, it came out that the 50 ways of giving, but we, we also, Without a real, I don't say strategy. Without a real strategy or focus, we're doing this before the foundation. The foundation allowed us to bring this in across the company, and really have a strategy around it that supports both the company and the, and the communities we serve, our clients we serve. And it's it's since we've have um, rolled this out, it's it's helped in recruitment, it's helped in retention of employees. I mean, the it's really it's important to the employees. To have this as part of the company, it's important to our clients. We were just out in Columbus, and we had a meeting with the uh, the mayor of, of Columbus, uh, Anthony Ginter, and we had just redone our our Columbus office. We wanted to show him, etc. And we gave him a little presentation. And the biggest takeaway from him was not all the engineering stuff we could do; it was the foundation and what we've done in Columbus to support the underserved. I mean, that that was his yeah. biggest takeaway. So it definitely is. is it's impactful and it's, it's, and it's not only feel good. It's a, it's a real good thing. That's awesome. That's really good to hear. All right. I just got a couple last questions. I'm going to wrap up with here a little bit on the career side of things. What is the number one trait that you feel is important for civil engineering professionals to have today? Trait skill. Uh, I'll say two, two things. Maybe this is, this applies on a civil engineering, but, but almost anybody listening the ability to listen and whether it's earlier in your career and you're listening to your supervisor, give you some directions on what, what his, his or her expectations are you for that day or that week, listen and, and make sure you understand and even repeat back on what those expectations are. Don't be thinking as soon as you start talking, what your answer is going to be or, or what you got to do, but really listen. And, as you, and then as you progress up, if you're a part of a team, listen to your team. Listen to your client. What are your clients really looking to do and, and question it? Then as you're a manager, then you got to start listening to your staff, right? And you got to be able to ask those probing questions to make sure you're hearing what they're feeling and seeing. So I think listening, true listening is, is, a, is really a key to success no matter what level you're at. Um, the other is, uh, as I, in my career, and we talked about this, 
don't be afraid to, to go outside the box a little bit. Don't be afraid to go beyond your limits a little bit. Take a chance, take a risk and see where it leads. Um, I think those are, you know, it's easy to say, get a good education, get good experience. But I mean, it's, it's these other skills that I think are, are more important in the longer term for overall success. Yeah, what I like about both of those is, to your point, you should be doing them from day one till the day you retire, right? I mean, <laughs> and so it's something that can keep progressing you throughout life, throughout your career. And, um, you know, it's not like you get to a certain level and you should stop listening. And also you should be listening early on, right? Be a sponge, soak up all the knowledge. I mean, that's how you learn. Um, so, so those are really good tips. Um, so Gary, I, I know you probably in your time have come into a lot of different leadership books, authors, trainings, things of that nature. I'm always curious as to if one book or author or philosophy has stuck out for you that you've leaned on over the years that you've come back to like a tried and true type of, you know, philosophy or book or something mm. like that. Hmm. And maybe the answer is no, but you know, sometimes no, I, 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 I don't know a, a, a particular, you know, I've read all the, you know, uh, all the classic books, but I don't know if anything sticks in my mind as being the book or the solution. I think it's, it's reading a lot, talking a lot. I'm in, I'm in a couple different CEO groups, listening okay. to other people's experiences and then, and then really trying those out you know, carefully in, in a situation. Um, you know, the, the one book, you know, uh, I'm drawing a blank on Lexion. Um, oh, Pat Lencioni about the, the teams. Yeah, getting the right people in the right seats on the bus. Right. You know, that, and I'm a big sports enthusiast and I like to use Makes sports all the time, all the time in analogies, right? Because there are teams, there are teams that, and there are teams that have different components. Yeah. And, you know, you're never going to put a first baseman behind a plate. I mean, right? I right. mean, it's never going to work. It, yep. So, it, you know, putting the right people on the right seats. And the, and, the, and the challenge with that is if you don't have enough seats on the bus, people will try and put themselves in the seats that's available when it's not the best seat for them. Mm. Yep. You know, and, and for example, Client managers. It takes a certain skill set to be a client. Maybe able to interact with the client and be able to sell to the client. So you don't want somebody who's great at cranking out numbers and designing something necessarily to be a client manager. But if the only career path they see is that client manager career path, they're going to want to aspire to be that when it's not really their strong suit. So you got to have a, a career path that's good for a project manager or, or for a technical expertise. And that's what we've learned. So you can you can get the right people voluntarily on the right seats on the bus by giving them an opportunity. So I like that. No, I think that that's critical. Right. People in the right seats is a, is a big deal. And I, and I think I agree with you. I think sports and business, there's a lot of analogies between I'm actually reading you know, the, a book right now for like the third time, which is by Bill Walsh, which is the score takes care of itself, which I love. And, you know, for those of you that don't know, Bill Walsh, he was a, he was an amazing well, Right. Yeah, amazing. For, took the 49ers from like a two win team to a Super Bowl team in, in, a, in a few years. And one of the things that he said is that I think rings very true in um, what we do is if you have a good strategy and good habits every day and you execute on them, the score is going to take care of itself. That's what he always told people. And we build a lot of one of the things we do at EMI is we build a lot of kind of custom project management programs for firms. And one of the things that I always ask people in these trainings is what makes for a great project. And the response I always get a lot of the times is good profits and happy clients. And my response to that is, no, that's kind of the byproduct of a successful right. project, right? What makes for a good project is, you know, you have to execute at every stage of the project life cycle over time and you have to build those good project management habits. And then the score will take care of itself. So I think like having some of those philosophies in place can be very helpful and to your staff too, to kind of use analogies and let them see why we're doing what we're doing and how we're going to get to the finish line of, of where we want to go. So Gary, listen, you spent some time with us today. We really appreciate it. We know how busy you are, but you've given us some, some great thoughts and I think some great advice for those out there that are looking to really grow in their careers, really in any, in any industry, quite frankly, some of the things that you shared with us 
Um, so I wish you all the best of luck continuing to evolve and grow uh, T&M. And, and thank you so much for some time here today. Hi, Anthony. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Good conversation. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Gary. What I love about his experience is that he's been with TNM for so long, so he's kind of evolved and progressed his career, and now he's had a major hand in kind of progressing and evolving the company, and it's so cool to kind of hear his journey with both of those. If you enjoyed the episode, please consider subscribing to our channel here. We put out videos like this on a weekly basis to help engineers become better managers and leaders. I'll see you next week.